Hi, Gabe. One second, Gabe. I got to get my ears in. Sorry, I'm late. Oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, basically, what happened is what normally happens. I get to doing something else, and I forget where I'm at. So, yeah. Yep. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How'd you do on the test? Not so good. <laughs> and how, how bad is not so good, Gabe? see yeah but you got you got a 10 percent the uh i gave the extra credit out right oh you did i don't know there's extra credit yeah there's extra credit oh my goodness okay let me check one second i swear to god if i didn't then i will i will reissue it but i'm i swear to god anybody else that's out there did you see the note on the extra credit no, uh, what, what extra credit? What's that, Kevin? I didn't see anything about extra credit. Okay, if I if it slipped by me, I will. If it slipped by me, I will be happy to go and uh, I'll reissue it. Okay. So I see it, but it says it opens tonight at seven. Okay. Do you see, Gabe? Do you see how long it goes till? No. Okay. I I'll. I'll I'll fix it, okay? I will fix it. Maybe I'll maybe I'll put it on. It starts at seven and I'll let it go till Friday. Okay, fair enough. It says, yeah. it says it's due October 15th at 9 a.m. Okay. Then that's what it is. Okay, Jasmina. Fair enough. All right. It's ten yep. percent. It's 13 points, I believe. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. I, I'm, I'm thank not, you. Look, not looking for thanks. Uh, basically, I'm just trying to just trying to recoup some of the grades. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I did terrible on that. Yeah, so. I, did, I did terrible. I thought it was better than my the first test, but then I saw the answer. I'm like, oh. Uh, I'm sorry. You gotta help me, guys. Uh, what what was this test about? Uh, like the ideal gas law and all that stuff. Oh. Yeah, uh, I thought there was questions on there that I we never even went over or where any uh, of our slides or anything. Well, I know I know that one of the major questions was the excess reagent. I know that when I went over. Uh, the other ones. We, I went over stoichiometry, Kevin. Uh, let me go. Let's see if I can grab it up. I did have a question. Could we uh, like get a test review a bit like earlier than the, like a couple of days before the test? You talking about the practice? Yeah, because we did the practice and it was like two days before. So if I had any questions about it, I didn't have time to ask you because we uh, never had a class. I will do the best I can, Kevin. <laughs> All right, I'm in here. You can, are you seeing the screen? Yeah. Okay. All right, exam two. All right, you see, are you seeing the exam two coming, popping up here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to even go through the last nine questions or so because those I did, I know I went over. Those were the questions on solutions and acids. Okay. Oh, I did have one question about those. In one of the questions, it says uh, the production of an acid in a base makes it nets H2O, and I know that it makes water. And salt. No, no, no. I so said that. I said it was false. No, I believe the question was what the net ionic reaction was. No, I mean, it, it was like when an acid and a base uh, mixes, does it make water? Uh, does it net water? It's uh, like number 12 or something. Acids react with carbonates to only make only salt and water. Yeah, this is the question. 
No, no, uh, the one above it. The one above it. The net reaction of acid with the base of the creation of H2O. I thought it was H2O and salt, so I put it false. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Because no, I no, Kevin, I Kevin, that's fine, Kevin. Kevin, you made your argument. Uh, you've made your argument. I can see how you can interpret it as that. Okay. What I should have done was was I should have put the net ionic reaction. I need to change the test to read net ionic reaction. And then it would be, yeah, then it would be true. Okay. Kevin, you're getting the point for that. Okay. All right. Yeah, I was just wondering. Thank you. All right. Uh, and anybody else that picked, did salt false on that, I will look at it. If you, anybody that's here that's made that argument. Other than that, uh, first couple questions, guys. These are gimmies. I gave you a couple easy questions at first to kind of ease you into this, to give you confidence, okay? For this one, all you had to do was figure out what the molecular weight of iron sulfate was, get the moles and divide it by the 125. For this one, this is a simple, again, simple equation. M1V1 equal M2V2. I really was trying to start you off with a couple of easy questions. Third one, all right, limiting reagent. I know I went over limiting reagent, okay? Then percent yield after that. You have to figure out how much you can make then use that, uh, use that amount, take the 9.980, divide it by the amount that you could make. That will give you the percent yield. Then you have to determine the amount of excess reagent left. I, fair question, guys. Uh, okay. This is using, this is using uh, molarity and volume to get moles. Once you have moles, it becomes a straight stoichiometric problem. So you take the 0 0.02035, multiply that by the 0 0.1048, that gives you moles of permanganate. You then have to multiply it by five to get the weight of the iron chloride, or to get the moles of the iron chloride, then use the molecular weight to get the, to get the uh, um, grams. Fifth question, acid-base titration. You have an acid and a base. The difference here is that you have aluminum hydroxide, which is ALOH taken three times, and HCl plus HCl. The molar ratio, if you balance that equation, there are three HCLs to every one aluminum hydroxide. You cannot work this problem just doing an MAVA equal MBVB because you don't have the one-to-one -one stoichiometric ratio. In this equation, you have to get the moles of aluminum hydroxide, multiply that by three moles of HCl over one mole of aluminum hydroxide. You get the moles of HCl, then you divide it by the 0 0.02200 liters. Simple problem coming up here. Moles are staying the same because you're transferring all of the gas into another cylinder. The temperature wasn't talked about. So the temperature stayed the same. So this becomes a simple P1V1 equal P2V2. 
Um, why would the answer have to be in atmospheres if we both because, have four? Because I, I requested it in atmospheres. That's why. Oh, man. I told you. Okay. I see. I see now. Okay. All right. This was the question I warned you about that you were going to be getting one of the gas laws. And basically, all you had to say, you were relating temperature and, I'm sorry, you're relating volume and moles when temperature and pressure are kept constant. So for this, you know that the pressure, because it's equal to force divided by area, then the pressure is equal to NMA divided by area. All right. If the temperature doesn't change, then the A is staying the same. The mass of the gas doesn't change. So you got the force is basically equal to number of particles divided by the area or moles divided by the volume. If the force change, if the force stays the same, if the force is constant, then when the moles goes up, the volume has to also go up to keep the force constant. That's all you needed to do for that. And last one. Okay, this is, uh, this, all right, for this one, can you get the moles of aluminum? Most of you guys did this. I, I, I know most of you did this wrong. Can you get the moles of aluminum, guys? Which question number are you on now? Uh, I'm on the last, the last problem question. Oh, okay. Can you get the moles of aluminum? Yeah. All right. So, is aluminum a gas? No. Then how in the world can you use it with the ideal gas law? Oh, you have to convert it? You have to convert it from moles of aluminum into moles of hydrogen. That yeah. is the only gas in there. Okay? And it also says that the hydrogen was collected. So you have to change the moles of aluminum into moles of hydrogen. Then once you have the moles of hydrogen, you do PV equal NRT to get the pressure of that hydrogen. Then you have the pressure of the hydrogen to get the total pressure. You have to add the water vapor pressure to it. So uh, in, in this problem, you had one of two things going, going with it. You either use the 0.143 to get moles of aluminum and applied that directly into the ideal gas law, or you subtracted the water vapor pressure from the pressure of the hydrogen when you should have added it. Okay. I have all, a question too. All in all, guys, Walmart I thought it was question. a fair test. Who, who, uh, Kevin, you have a question? Yeah, on number question number 10, it says acids are slippery. What did you mean by that? <laughs> okay. Oh, because bases. One of the properties uh, of feel slippery. bases are slippery. Uh, I figured because acids were normally <laughs> liquids or gas, you could no. slip on a gas so. no. <laughs> or a liquid. That's one of the all properties right. of one of the definite. I'll give you one, Kevin. I won't give you the second one. All right. Yeah. I was just wondering for my peace of mind in that one. I, it was one of the properties specifically I mentioned about bases. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't sure. Anybody have anything else, guys? All in all, I, did, I thought it was a fair test. Do you feel you had the time to do it? Oh, yeah. I think yeah. I gave you two and a half hours for this test. Is there anybody that felt constrained by the time on this? People have different philosophies about giving tests, okay? Generally speaking, yes, I know my tests are long, but my philosophy about that is you guys are studying a whole bunch of material. I like to make different questions so that I'll at least hit something of what you've studied. So that explains why my tests are a little longer. How many questions are on the uh, extra credit thing? 
Uh, I think uh, I think I broke it up into two. Okay, okay, thank you. I and think, it's the gas laws. It's like the same as this test. Uh, Similar questions. I mean, yeah, it's like uh, same material is what I mean. I don't even know where I put it. I think I put it in Dropbox. Yes, it's in Dropbox. Okay, now the. Okay. Edit folder. Maybe that'll do it for me. Ah, there we go. Two questions, eight and I got to move this thing for a second. Eight and four points. Uh, basically, give a similar chemical reaction, give you two amounts. What's the limiting reagent? How much is precipitated? How much of the excess remains? Then I go on to the second question. You have that much HCl with that much aluminum and you collect the hydrogen above water. What's the total pressure if the volume was collected? So basically, yes, they simulate, they simulate the, uh, the two questions I felt that you guys didn't do so well on. And there were 13, eight for the first one, five for the second. Any questions, guys? Oh, um, no. Okay. So I'm going to move this thing again so I can get it into. I'm going to stop share now, guys. And we do have to get into thermochemistry. Before I start, though, are there any other questions, guys? Anything else? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you're gonna be introduced to the subject that is the reason why I am not a physical chemist at this point. It was the area of chemistry that interested me the most when I was an undergraduate, but once I got into this stuff, I said, uh-uh. You have to have too strong a math background to get involved in it. And thermochemistry screws up, it's a logic thing that you have to pay attention to, okay? So there are going to be some things that are going to be involved here. That may seem a little strange. We'll get through it. We'll work our way through it. Hands down, hands down in the summer course, the students said this was the hardest subject for them to have, hardest chapter, hands down. So that was why I really sent the letter out encouraging you to come be involved and come today. So what we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk again, we're gonna start with different types of energy, potential, kinetic, and chemical. We're gonna quickly go through the units. We're dealing with the first law of thermodynamics. You won't get to the second and third laws of thermodynamics until you get into chem two. We're gonna deal with enthalpy of reactions. Guys, you are going to do calorimetry problems. I will deal with state functions and Hess's law. So that's basically what we have in store for us. So one of the definitions of energy is the ability to do work or to transfer heat. Work is basically energy that's used to cause an object with ha that has mass to move. In other words, it's moving something. If you take a shovel full of dirt, you are moving that dirt. You are doing work. The other part is heat. And basically heat is the energy that is transfers temperature from one object to another, which is why you do not grab a hot iron skillet. So overall, we have energy is going to be equal to work and heat. All right, potential energy is the energy associated with position or composition. Now guys, you're seeing this cat here, right? Don't you just want to push it over? 
I mean, it, it's just this picture. Just I just want to grab the cat and just kind of like give it a little shove so that it has now kinetic energy. Right now, it only has potential energy because it's sitting higher than what it could be. Kinetic energy, on the other hand, is the energy of motion. Generally speaking, the formula for kinetic energy in physics is one half the mass times the volume squared, mass times the velocity squared. So kinetic energy is movement, potential energy is position or composition. Now you can turn one or the other. If you have oil sitting in a barrel, it has potential energy because that oil has chemical bonds. Those chemical bonds can be broken, can be reformed. And when that happens, you get a change in the energy of the system. So oil sitting in a barrel is an example of potential energy of composition. On the other hand, if you have the water in the Niagara River that's flowing over the falls, that is a positional energy change. So potential can be chemical, it can be positional. And you can turn kinetic into potential, you can turn potential into kinetic. Remember, the law of conservation of energy, energy gets saved. It doesn't, we can't create energy, we can't, uh, we can't lose energy. So when we're talking about the chemical energy, and which is exactly what we're talking about here, guys, you have to understand this. The chemical energy, the thing that forced that drives chemical reactions to go is because chemicals are bonded to one another. Because they are bonded to one another, there is an energy holding those things together. If you put energy into that system, you break the bonds, okay? And then you have these independent things floating around here, and then they reform. When they reform, they release energy. So in order to break chemical bonds, you need to put energy in. To when bonds form again, that is a releasing of energy. So chemical energy is the energy in between the individual atoms within a molecule. And you're gonna learn this over and over again if you get through organic chemistry. Again, kinetic and potential are interconvertible. I like this slide. Sorry, I got I'm closing my door because my dogs are going crazy. Let me rephrase that. One dog. The other dog's sleeping in the back of me. Funny slide? You like the slide? I'm not getting any chuckles. Do I need to take it out? That's pretty funny. All right. Now, when we are dealing with energy, you have to understand that energy, the two forms of energy are work and heat. So the work and the heat are equal to the energy. Work is distance times force. And it's measured in a unit called joules. By definition, a joule is equal to one kilogram per meter squared over second squared. That is what a joule by definition is. In other words, it's the energy required to take an object that weighs one kilogram and make it move one meter per second squared. We also have the other definition of energy, the one you're probably more familiar with, and that is calorie. 
And by definition, a calorie is the amount of energy required to raise one gram of water, one degree centigrade. The inner conversion, one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. Coincidentally, guys, if a calorie is the amount that required to raise one gram of water, one degree centigrade, for future reference, when we're going in and doing the calorimetry experiments, we're dealing with specific heat, so by definition, the specific heat of water is one calorie per gram degree Celsius. Because one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules, the specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram C. Depending upon what unit of energy you use one or the other specific heats. And we will get into that in a few minutes. Now, the real calorie that you're interested in, the one that you really, really know about, the one that's on the cereal boxes, that is in actuality, a capital C calorie. It is in reality a kilocalorie. It's 1000 times what a calorie is, what the heat unit calorie is. Similarly, a kilojoule is 1000 times what a joule is. First law, first law of thermodynamics, total energy of the universe is constant. That's all the first law says. So we have to deal with things called systems and surroundings. A system is nothing more than the area you are investigating. It includes everything within that area. If we're dealing with this, the system of this reaction is dealing with the space of the cylinder and everything that is within that cylinder, the hydrogen and oxygen molecules. The concept you have to realize is the surroundings are everything that is outside of that system. In this case, it would be everything outside the cylinder and the piston. Now, since energy is neither created nor destroyed, if we, if the system creates energy, that energy gets distributed to the surroundings. So the system loses energy because the energy got transferred into the surroundings. If on the other hand, the system is absorbing energy, it had to get that energy from somewhere. So what it does is it grabs things from the surroundings. It pulls energy from the surroundings and absorbs that energy. So what in effect happens is the system gains energy, the surroundings lose energy. So basically, whatever happens to the system, the opposite thing happens to the surroundings. If we're dealing with the entire of, of a system, if we're dealing with the energy, we're dealing with the kinetic and potential energy of all components. That will be the entire energy that I'm going to designate as E. By definition, if the energy changes, the change in the energy, the delta E is going to be what the final energy was minus what the initial energy was. I haven't put anybody in quicksand yet, right? Everybody's, no. everybody's following along with what's happening, correct? Yes. 
So, yes. who is Angry Tarpon anyway? That's Ian. I'm on my phone. I'm now. Okay, Ian, I'm not going to ask you any questions because you're giving me a bad echo, okay? Ian, turn your mic off. Ian, turn your mic off. Thank you. All right. If we have our system and the system somehow gains energy so that the final energy is greater than the initial, then it has absorbed energy from the surroundings. And that energy change is called endothermic. Remember, delta E is equal to E final minus E initial. So therefore, if it's absorbing energy, E final is greater than E initial, we have a positive sign. Endothermic, positive sign. Conversely, if the system loses energy, then the system is releasing that energy somewhere to the surroundings. So the system has less energy. E final is less than E initial. Therefore, it's exothermic and the sign is negative. Now, when we're dealing with temperature and we're dealing with heat, the thermal energy that we're talking about there is the energy associated with molecules and atoms moving back and forth amongst one another. That movement creates energy. That movement creates energy and creates energy in the form of temperature or heat. Rather, heat, not temperature. So if we have, and you guys know this, you know this because you're not going to grab an iron skillet that's sitting in a stove at 400 degrees. You know that heat gets transferred. If the heat gets released, the minute you touch that iron skillet, that skillet is transferring heat from it to you, which means that you're going to burn. You've gotten extra energy. So your energy has increased. The skillets has gone down. So the skillet would have a negative sign. It is exothermic. You are now have absorbed that heat. You have undergone an endothermic. Remember again, energy can't be created or destroyed. So we have two ways. Remember we said energy is equal to work and heat. Remember that? Remember? Remember I said way back when? Energy is equal to heat plus work. So we have two parameters we have to deal with when we're determining the energy of a system. Our delta E is equal to the change in heat plus the change in work. All right. This is the first concept you have to get down. If the system does work on the surroundings, for example, if the pressure in the cylinder is such that it pushes the cylinder up, it is doing work on the surroundings. Therefore, the sign is negative. If the system does work on the surroundings, the sign is negative for the system. On the other hand, if the pressure of the surroundings pushes that cylinder down, then the surroundings are doing work on the system. The sign is positive. Energy also can be transferred as heat. 
in this instance, if we're looking at the flame, believe it or not, that flame is losing some of, it, some of its energy because it is transferring that heat to the spatula. So if, if our system is the flame, we are losing heat. If we're losing heat, it's an exothermic process. Heat flows from warmer objects to cooler objects. If it gains heat from the surroundings, the sign is positive. If the system loses heat to the surroundings, then the sign is negative. Perfect example, guys. Okay. Has anybody broken a bone where you have, where they go into the emergency room, they take that plastic container, pop it, and then put it on your, on your area that's hurting? Anybody had that? Nobody? Do you at least know what I'm talking about? No, I don't. Okay, there is something they have in emergency rooms. There is a chemical with a, with generally speaking, there is a salt and there is water in this. What they do is they, they're separated from each other. So what the nurse does is she will slam the two together and break the inner plastic bags. And what happens is the powder mixes with the liquid. And what happens there is it takes energy to get that salt to dissolve in the liquid. So it takes energy to get this to happen. It does happen. So what happens is that cold pack takes energy from the surroundings and puts that energy into the dissolving of that salt. That energy had to come from somewhere. It had to come from the surroundings. The surroundings, the plastic bag become colder. That is why when you put it on an injury, it feels cold to you. So is that exothermic? The, it depends upon what you're talking about, Kevin. All right. The, the bag itself losing heat or getting cold. The getting colder, all right. The system, which is the dissolution of the salt in the water, that's absorbing energy. That is endothermic. Okay. Oh, so you can absorb. It doesn't have it, to necessarily be hot. You can absorb cold too. It's gaining well, it's, energy. No, but... no. It's the energy of the system needs to take needs in order to get the salt to dissolve. Okay. You need to have energy in there. You need to input energy to dissolve the salt. Does that part? Is that part understood, Kevin? Yeah, I'm just wondering if the temperature is directly correlated. Like, does it have to be hot? Does it have to be getting hotter if it's endothermic or getting colder if it's exothermic? Because if it's getting colder, then I don't understand how it would be endothermic. Okay, Kevin, you have to realize we're talking two different things. We're talking about the system and we're talking about the surroundings, okay? In this yeah. instance, we're talking about the system gaining an energy, okay? The system had to input energy to get that salt dissolved, okay, Kevin? Yeah, yep. But that energy had to come from somewhere. The somewhere it came from were the surroundings. And because of the surroundings, losing energy, that's why the bag feels cold. All right, Kevin. Okay. S similar circumstance. There are these heat packs that hunters have. Same exact thing. You have two different, two different chemicals that are in plastic bags and this bag surrounded by an outer bag. When you smack the two together, the two chemicals react, you get a chemical reaction going there. And this chemical reaction releases heat. So the chemical reaction 
is a is our system that is losing heat. It is exothermic. That heat has to go somewhere. The environment gets that heat and feels the increased temperature. Are you okay, Kevin? Yeah, I get it. I get it. I don't think Anybody I else confused about this? We have to understand, we have to keep the system separate from the surroundings. And literally speaking, what is happening to the system is the opposite thing that's happening to the surroundings. All right. Now, because the overall energy of our system is equal to the Q heat we're dealing with the system and the work. All right. So if the system is releasing heat, then the sign of my Q is going to be negative. Important slide, guys, for these. This is important for these things that are occurring down here. If my system is doing work, if the system is doing work, the sign of the work is going to be negative. On the other hand, if my system absorbs heat, then my Q is going to be positive. If the surroundings do work on my system, then my work is going to be positive. Surroundings doing work on the system positive. System doing work on the surroundings, negative. Giving off heat. System giving off heat, Q is negative. Heat being absorbed by the system, positive. So we are going to get into some problems. Calculate the overall change in internal energy for a system that absorbs 326 joules of heat and does 200 joules of work on its surroundings. Absorbing heat, is that sign going to be positive or negative? Absorbing heat. Positive. Okay. Doing work on the surroundings, positive negative. or negative? Yeah. Doing work on these on the surroundings. Is it positive or negative? Negative. So we have a positive Q and a negative W. So when I'm doing this problem, I'm going to take my Q is positive. To that, I'm going to add a negative W. So overall. My overall change in energy is a positive 126. Are we good here, guys? Gabe, calculate, yeah. calculate the change in internal energy for a system that releases 2.73 kilojoules and does 7.34 kilojoules of work. It releases heat. Is that going to be negative or positive? Negative. Okay, so my 2.73 is negative. If it does work, is that negative or is that positive? It would be negative, no. Negative. Negative, okay. So what I would do is I would take negative 2.73 kilojoules and subtract 7.34 from that. So I would get 10.07, negative 10.07 kilojoules. Are we good, Gabe? Yes. Layla. Yes. All right. The internal system, internal energy changes by a negative 2.45 kilojoules. 
when the system releases 358 kilojoules of heat. Determine whether work is done on the system or whether the system does work on the surroundings. How do you think we're gonna solve this, Layla? Um, by subtracting them. Okay. Look at the formula we're dealing with, Layla. The change in energy is equal to Q plus W. So what is the negative 2.45 kilojoules? Oh, is that's that, the I'm sorry? That's the energy. So that's gonna go on the one side of the equation, negative 2.45. Now, the system releases 358 kilojoules of heat. What's the, what is that? Is that Q or W? That's the only two things left. Um, Q. Q. I, Layla, look at the last sentence. The last sentence is telling you to determine whether work is done. So work is W. So the 358 must be the Q. Now, the system released 358 kilojoules. Is the 358 positive or negative? Negative. So at this point, I have negative 2.45 kilojoules is equal to a negative 358 kilojoules plus W. So you would add it. I would add a positive 358 to 2.45 and that would end up being about 356, a positive 356 for W. Does it make, does it make sense, Layla? Yeah. Guys, the biggest part of this, the biggest part of doing problems like this is understanding this slide. Understanding when work is positive and when it's negative and when heat is positive or when it's negative. Questions about this so far, guys? Okay. When it's done, when work is done in an open container, basically all you're doing is changing the volume or you're getting the volume changed. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. What we've been talking about in the cylinder is the change of the volume. Now, if work is equal to force times distance and the force is equal to pressure times area, then the work is equal to the pressure times the area times the change in height. Area times the change in height is the volume. So my work is actually equal to my external pressure times the change in volume. Am I saying anything that's foolish here? Does this make sense to you? We're relating, all we're doing right now is relating work to pressure and change in volume. The only detail we need to account for is the sign. So when work is done on the surroundings, it's negative. When you do work, your delta H increases. Therefore, the signs are opposite. If we measure the amount of work done by a gas, then the work is going to be negative P times change in volume. Okay? Because if it's doing if it's doing work on the on the surroundings, if work is being done by the system, then the volume is increasing. So if it's doing work on the syst, on the surroundings, then W has to be has to be uh, negative. We got that. 
Work is being done on the surroundings. Therefore, the work has to be negative, but our volume is increasing. So basically we have to realize that if work is being done on the surroundings, then my W is gonna be equal to negative P delta V. I'm hearing crickets. We good? Are we good here, guys? Remember, we said, if the system is doing work, system doing work means that the height is increasing in the cylinder, correct? So yeah. if the system is doing work on the surroundings, then because the height is increasing, our work is equal to negative P delta V. All right, now we have to invoke another term and that is called enthalpy. If, if the process takes place at constant pressure and think about it guys, when do we do most of our chemical reactions? Do we heat up the room? Do we heat up the room and, and do we put pressure into the room as the chemical reaction is taking place? Or do we just have it undergo at constant pressure? Most chemical oh. reactions do take place under constant pressure. If the only work we're doing is pressure volume work, then the heat flow during the process, we're measuring that heat flow is the enthalpy of our system at constant pressure. And enthalpy H, enthalpy is H, is nothing more than the original internal energy plus the product of the pressure and the volume. If I wanna know the change in enthalpy, then that change is gonna be equal to the change of the energy plus the pressure times the volume. And this can be written since pressure is constant, then my enthalpy is gonna be equal to my change in energy plus my constant pressure times the change in the volume. Since delta E is equal to Q plus W and W is equal to negative P delta V. If I substitute these two things, put Q plus W in there and make this a negative P delta V at constant pressure, my change in enthalpy is gonna be equal to simply the heat transfer. And that's where we were going with this. We derived what the enthalpy of our system is. At constant pressure, it's nothing more than the heat transfer. Are we okay? This is the first law of thermodynamics. Guys, are we okay? Yeah. You're gonna need, you may need to go over the videos again, relook at the PowerPoints, but you're need, gonna need to get this stuff down. So when we are dealing with endothermic or exothermic, when H is positive, when the Q is positive, that is an endothermic reaction. Opposite, when the system is giving up heat, delta H is negative. 
So if you remember from intro, you learned about endothermic and exothermic, that endothermic was a positive number and exothermic was a negative number. This is basically why. So when we're dealing with the enthalpies of reaction, we're looking at, remember, the change in energy, the change in the Q. So our change in enthalpy is going to be our enthalpy of our products minus the enthalpy of our reactants. And this makes sense, guys, because if our energy after the reaction is here and we started off here, didn't we lose energy? And if we lost energy, that number is negative because our reactants have less energy than our, our I'm sorry, our products have less energy than our reactants. My delta H is negative. That reaction was exothermic. On the other hand, if my products have more energy than my reactants, then my products minus my reactants has a positive sign. That reactant would be endothermic. So we're basically talking, when we're dealing with enthalpy, we're talking about the heat of the chemical reaction. It depends, enthalpy depends upon where you're starting from. Do gases have more energy than solids? Are they moving faster? I'm getting crickets here. Yes. Yeah. Gases are moving faster than solids are. So doesn't it make sense if we want to figure out where we're starting from, we have to know the state of what we're talking about. Yeah. So my change in my enthalpy, my, my change in the energy of the reaction is going to also depend upon the state of the products and the state of the reactants. And it refers to all species in the molar amounts. This is a, this is a hard concept to understand. It refers to all species in the molar amounts specif specified, specified by the coefficients in the balanced reaction. So if I have methane plus two oxygens making one carbon dioxide and two waters, and if I tell you that the delta H of that is negative to 890.4 kilojoules, I need to have one mole of methane. I need to have two moles of oxygen. I need to have made one mole of carbon dioxide and two moles of water. If I have only one mole of oxygen, what this means to you is that I don't have enough oxygen. My reaction is limited by the fact that I don't have enough oxygen. So even though this out here says negative 890.4 kilojoules per mole, what we mean by that is that we have to take into account the coefficients in front of the reactants and the products. If I have only one mole of oxygen, then my heat generated is limited by the fact I only have one mole of oxygen and therefore the heat that I've made can only be a negative 445.2 kilojoules per mole. It's like the same thing if I had only half a mole of methane. On the other hand, if I had two methanes and four oxygens, then I'm going to double 
my heat of reaction. I'm hearing crickets, guys. Are we good about this? So you're saying if you had one mole of water, you just half the amount of joules? If I made only one mole of water, then I only generated 445 point, negative 445.2 kilojoules. Roger that. Okay. You have to have this much of each one of these things. One, one mole of methane, two moles of, of oxygen, one mole of that, two moles of that, in order to make this much heat. If you don't have that, then you're not gonna make that much heat. If I double it, then I'm gonna double the heat I produced. If I double all the moles, then that means that I'm going to double the heat of my reaction. If it's reversed, if I make my products reactants and my reactants products, then what happens is I reverse the sign of my enthalpy. If instead of making CH4 plus two O2s I get, and getting CO2 in two waters, if I react two waters and a carbon dioxide and make methane and two oxygen molecules from that, I'm gonna need 890.4 kilojoules of energy per mole per mole of energy in order to get that reaction to go. Does that make sense to you? If you flip the reaction, the sign of the enthalpy flips as well. Is this making sense, guys? Yeah. The production of sugar by plants through photosynthesis requires 2,803 kilojoules per mole. Calculate the solar energy required to make one pound 454 grams of sugar. All right. What is the number in front of the sugar? What's the coefficient in front of sugar, guys? One. One. Okay. So if I have one mole of this, if I have one mole of this, I'll generate that many kilojoules per mole, right? Yeah. So you calculate the moles. Do I have one mole? I actually have more than one mole, don't I? Yeah. So uh, first thing I have to do in this particular problem is I have to turn my grams into moles because having grams is not going to do a thing for me in this particular problem. I do that math out and I have 2.52 moles. Now I skipped a step here and that is I need one mole of this to react. Okay, so if it's one mole to react, then all it's a direct conversion for 2.54 moles times my energy per mole, and that will give me 70, 60 kilojoules. Now, if I was going to do that same problem, saying I had 454 grams of water. Okay, now I would have to divide my moles by my water. Let's go and show. I'm gonna take my 454 point, 454 grams of water times one mole over 18.02 grams. 
And that's going to be equal to twenty five point one nine moles. But I need this is moles of water. But I need six of them. I need six of them because guys, the coefficient in front of the water is six. So I have to take my 25.19 and I'm going to divide it by six. That's going to give me 4.19 moles times the 2803 joules per mole and this will give me eleven thousand eight hundred kilojoules of energy that was produced are we understanding the concepts here guys I'm not getting yeah. any I'm not getting any feedback at all from you. No, Tell me what you don't, Gabe. Gabe. Yeah. Tell me what you're not understanding about this process. Oh, uh, I mean, I'm understanding it. It's just, it's kind of long and complicated. I need to go back and look at the PowerPoints again. Like just to kind of. Then do it. Jasmine, yeah. are you good about this? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Layla. Yeah. Ian, we good? I think Ian stopped because of his mic. Okay, guys, this is, it's about time. This is basically where, do you, do you, would it, uh, let me ask you this question. Would it be more beneficial for me to go over it now or to start next lecture with this, with this equation? Uh, probably next. Okay. Well, how much time do we have enough time to go through it? I need uh, to go to my math class, so I can't stay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Why don't, so we go next... over, why don't we go over it next time? This is where we'll start off next time. All right. Sounds okay. good. Thank you, Professor. It's my, hey, believe me, it's my pleasure, guys. My pleasure. So uh, take care. I will see you on Thursday then. And some of you I'll see tonight in, in the uh, gas law experiment that I still have to write up. Okay. Yeah, I have um, a question. Thank you. Yeah, please. I, got, uh, I always got questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I I'm, uh, hope I've been receptive to answering them. With the thermodynamics quiz, are you going to open it back up like the last one since we just went through it or? No, no. I wanted you to go through this stuff so that you had a little bit of understanding. So no, I'm not uh, reopening it, Kevin. That's okay, the idea. Those were simple. The, the questions on the thermodynamics, I went over multiple times. They are fairly easy questions that I really believe you could have searched through the PowerPoint and come up with the answers to them. And that's the All whole right. reasoning. That's the whole reasoning, Kevin, is I do want you to at least kind of scuffle through the PowerPoint to try and see if you can come up with answers because that will that starts you with a foundation. Okay? I'm sorry, but that's yeah. just the questions I, just... I really believe were not that difficult. Okay, yeah, just the, the last one. I figured you probably would this one. Okay. Uh, studying for another test, so I didn't I'm gonna do stop it. Sorry. Kevin, I'm gonna stop sharing. We're gonna go through the we're gonna go through that. Okay. Okay. Okay, we're gonna go to are you seeing the screen? Yeah. Okay, that was quiz eleven.
Yeah, I never, I never even did it. I was studying for another test. I thought okay. he would reopen this one like the last no. one. No. Okay. It's, it's going to be fairly easy since you've already had the lecture. Okay, add added questions. Continue. If you want, you can just send no. me this link or something so you can get off and take a break between your classes. Uh, I've go got a break. I've got to a 5.30, Kevin. Oh, okay. All right, this is the question. Change in energy is related to heat and work by which formula? Answer the question, Kevin. Was, it, was, this, was this question readily available in the slideshow? Kevin? Kevin's not answering. Kevin? Oh, oh I thought I was unmuted. It's the, uh, I was talking the whole time. It's the work plus the temperature. Okay. All right. If you do that much work on a system that gains 20 joules of energy, you have. If you do that much work on a system that gains, a system gains energy, so positive. So oh. you, oh, you lose. So. I'm sorry, wait, wait, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. This yeah, is the energy, four. so you got 20 joules is equal to this plus the, plus the Q, right? 20 joules. What's 20 the joules energy? is the energy. E is equal to oh, W plus Q. Oh, energy. Okay, so it's 16 plus 20 then. No, it's 20 minus 16. So 20. energy, energy is equal to 20 joules, a positive 20 joules, right? Yeah. That's equal to Q plus W. We don't know what Q is, but we know what W is. W, work. if we're doing work on a system, we are gaining, we are we're doing work on the system. So the work is a positive number. So basically we have 20 is equal to Q plus W, 20 is equal to Q plus 16, Q is equal to a positive four. Okay. And is that, that's the gaining, so is that endothermic? That should be an endothermic gain. Okay. 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 You had, I know you had this equation in I know you had this equation in uh, our intro, the, cal the cal calorimetry question, equation. Q is equal I to mass times specific heat times temperature final minus temperature initial. The only thing of these which isn't in there is the molarity. Are you seeing Kevin what I'm saying about this being a general, qu general quiz? Yeah, I don't remember that formula, but Ian wants to know, he typed something in the chat. Let's What's see. That? I'm sorry, Ian I says, don't. He said for the last question, if the answer is four, why yeah. is the cre correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I need to go over it. Okay. I need okay. to go. I need to go over it. Ian's correct. Okay. It didn't. From okay. my explanation, it didn't seem right. And I'm going to go over it, and I will give you credit for it. Okay. I'll give you credit for the right answer. All right, I don't remember this formula. Q uh, how about M cap? Q is equal to M C delta T. Do you remember that one? C delta T M C. So what is what do they mean? What are they? Q. We're gonna go. Is... We're gonna get into it. Oh, okay. It means well, that then... the heat the heat of an object is equal to its mass times its specific heat times the change in temperatures. Oh yeah, I don't know anything about that. All right. Well, I guess I'll just I'll have to learn that. Okay. Again, these are all questions that can be easily found in the PowerPoint. I just wanted to go through a couple so that I could demonstrate it. Okay. 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 
All right. All right. I'll see take, you later then. Take care. Ian, take care. <laughs>
glasses still on? 